Now, on uh, the pandemic, a key moment today, uh, more than 50,000 official deaths. Yes, so that very grim milestone, as you say today, Kirsty. And if we look at this graphic, we can now see that the UK has become the first European country to record more than 50,000 deaths. There you are, uh, 50,365. And this is uh, according to the most widely accepted definition, which is death within 28 days of a positive test. And what took us over the line there were 595 deaths reported in the last 24-hour period. Now, how do these figures compare with other countries around the world? So if we look at this graph, we can see that in terms of actual deaths, the UK is, there it is, it's in fifth place in the world with, as we said, the highest numbers in Europe. It's important to say that countries do not record their numbers in the same way, so you cannot make exact comparisons. But let's look at another graphic, and what this does is that this looks at deaths on the most widely accepted measurement, that is the number of deaths per 100,000 people, 100,000 population. And on that, the UK comes in some way behind Spain, but just in front of the United States. Now, on that 50,000 milestone, this is what Boris Johnson had to say. Every, every death is a, is a, is a tragedy and we, we mourn uh, everybody who's gone and, and, and our feelings are with the, uh, their families as, and, and friends as well. Um, it, it is a, a, a global pandemic whose uh, effects, uh, whose treatments, uh, uh, whose implications for the economy uh, have, you know, all those have been becoming uh, clearer and clearer as the, as the months have, have gone on. Uh, I do think that uh, we've got now to a, a different phase in the way that we, uh, we treat it. And after the, these, these tough autumn measures, which I hope people uh, will stick to really, really uh, rigidly as far as, as they possibly can, uh, we're very much hoping that two things will start to come to our aid. Uh, number one, uh, the, the mass testing, the, the kind I just described, the, the rapid turnaround testing. And then the other thing is now the prospect, the realistic prospect of a, of a vaccine. So you have a kind of, as it were, two uh, boxing gloves to, to pummel the, uh, the disease in the, in the weeks and, uh, and months that, that follow. The Prime Minister, well, later in the programme, we'll be discussing the resignation of Boris Johnson's Director of Communications, Lee Kane, with our political panel. But first, let's look at the UK's COVID response in greater detail. Joining me is the former government scientific advisor and current member of SAGE, Professor Sir Mark Walport. And from Sheffield, Dr. Danielle Bryden, the Vice Dean at the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. Danielle treats patients with COVID in the intensive care unit. And we also have Jamie Brown, whose father, Tony Brown, died in COVID-19 during the first lockdown in Colchester. Now, we did ask the government to speak, but it declined to talk to us tonight. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, Jamie Brown, if I can begin with you, we talk about a figure of 50,000 plus, but of course, every life lost is devastating for a family. And I wonder if you can tell us what happened to your dad. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so my dad, Tony Brown, uh, passed away on the 29th of March. Um, he was 65. And whilst I hate doing this qualification, no underlying health conditions. Um, we think Dad contracted COVID uh, probably on the 12th of March. He was living in the east coast of Essex, but travelling up to London once a week for work. Uh, he travelled up on the train on Thursday, uh, took the tube uh, before the first lockdown was called. Um, a few days later, fell ill, was bedridden. A few days after that, when it wasn't getting any better, he called 111. They told him to take paracetamol to stay in bed because this is a mild illness uh, and he'd recover. The messaging at the time then was very much stay at home, protect the NHS. So dad was adamant that's what he was going to do. He stayed home, he kept taking paracetamol. He thought he was getting better. Uh, his fever seemed to be getting uh, reduced, his temperature was down. A few days later, it was back up again. He had uh, an evening of, of, of dizziness, of, of struggling, being short of breath, struggling to breathe. Um, Next morning, he'd been nauseous in the night, um, called 111 again, got an ambulance. He managed to get downstairs unaided, um, took the ambulance to Colchester General, and um, within within five minutes of arriving at the hospital, after all that, he, um, he he'd essentially run out of oxygen and his heart stopped, um, and he died. 
How um, dreadful. We're very sorry for your loss. And I wonder, you know, was it very important to him to protect the NHS? Was that something that he felt that he had to do personally because he could have gone in earlier, couldn't he? It's very much the idea that we were being told that unless you were one of these high risk groups, unless you're one of these high risk groups, you, you should be able to fight it off. There's almost an expectation and, and a duty that we were all trying to, to do our best to stay away from overloading and overwhelming the, the health service. Yeah. Let me, let so me that put that, let me put that, sorry to interrupt, let me put that to Danny Albright. In your experience uh, in ICU, is that something that families often say to you that people were trying to do their best and not come in? Good evening, Kirsty, and I'd just also like to offer my condolences to, to Jamie. Um, his story very powerfully illustrates some of the issues that we do come across in intensive care, both in terms of patients and their relatives, perhaps underestimating the seriousness of COVID. Um, there might be a perception amongst the public that, that COVID is not as, as serious as it, as, it, as it might be perceived, but for a a small number of people, it is a very serious life-threatening disease. And so the public health messaging around keeping the community spread of COVID down is really important because it does have serious consequences for some people. And what has been your overriding experience of COVID in ICU where you are treating desperately ill patients? Um, I think over the course of the year, we have had significant progress in terms of the treatments that we can give to people in intensive care and we have made significant inroads into improving survival from COVID but it is still a significantly important disease and unfortunately a number of people do still not survive mm -hmm. when they come to intensive care with COVID and managing their end of life care is really important and that can be difficult for their family and relatives who are at home as well. Yeah. So it's changed a great deal over the course of the year, but there are still some things that are fundamentally important and still remain, which is, is, is making sure that people at the end of their lives are, are treated well. Um, Dr. Uh, Woolport, um, what will make a difference? Because the R rate is persistently over one and it's between 1.1, I understand, and 1.3. What is the key thing that needs to be done? Well, at the moment, the key thing that needs to be done is social distancing. It's actually making it difficult for the virus to jump from one person to another. That is the number one thing. And every one of these deaths is a tragedy, not only for the individual, but for their families. And a thousand people have been announced having died in the last 24 hours, for, sorry, 48 hours. Um, so it's really important going forward, we continue to maintain our vigilance. Now, we maintain social distance, but I wonder because we heard uh, Michael Gove saying, you know, in, in response to our question, you know, will the lockdown in England continue after the allotted time beyond the 2nd of December? And he said, possibly it might have to. Then we had Boris Johnson saying, adamantly, it will not continue. Um, what will govern those, what should govern that decision? What should govern the decision is the rate of new cases at the end of the day, because whilst the reproduction number is greater than one, in other words, 100 people affect, infect another 100 or a bit more as it is at the moment, then the rates will remain high. And the challenge at the moment is that the numbers of cases are very high, uh, particularly in, in the north, the northeast, the midlands, and uh, the number of patients in hospitals is going up. And it's, it's important because people look at the rest of the country and say, uh, we don't need to do as much. But the cases are rising even faster. Yeah. Proportionally. And I wonder if SAGE is going to be convened to discuss this very issue, because you know there is obviously disagreement and, and different issues in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England and different decisions. But from SAGE's point of view, is it something that you think that you should take part in a discussion as to when this lockdown should end? The job of SAGE is to provide the evidence through Patrick Vallance and Chris Whitty to ministers to show them the numbers. And uh, SAGE meets at least once a week and recently a little bit more. So uh, the answer is our job is to provide the evidence. Uh, it's the policymakers that need to take the decisions. But the numbers are becoming more obvious. And for example, in Leeds, we've seen that they've got more patients in hospital at the moment than they had at the height of the pandemic in April. I mean, I heard you saying that actually this virus is no respecter of time or no. place. And so therefore, uh, coming back to you, Jamie Brown, on the question of, you know, obviously, um, the festive season is going to be a very different season for you this year, but I wonder if you think that people should just forgo it for one year if it makes a difference to that rate of infection. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
anyone who has lost anyone is going to know that, frankly, there's the, the horrible stories of when we get this wrong. Um, Christmas is going to be an awful time for everyone who's lost someone, and and to to risk um, passing it on even further is is really horrible. I mean, uh, after losing my dad, I joined COVID nineteen Bereaved Families for Justice, and we've been calling for an independent statutory inquiry into the handling of this pandemic because we shouldn't be in this predicament now. We went through this once before, and the most horrible thing to watch all of it unfolding again is exactly how predictable the numbers are. We knew exactly where we were going. Sage knew they've won the government, and and yet, once again, total inaction, and thousands and thousands more people are dying. It's completely unacceptable. Yeah, we should sacrifice a festive season if we have to. Well, we have to do everything we can to keep the numbers down. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Can I just come back to you, uh, Dr. Bryan, on the question of um, excess deaths and treatment, in fact, in ICU? You know, we already know that some cancer treatments are being delayed again in different parts of the country. You know, the NHS. It protect the NHS, what will that actually really mean? Will it mean protect the NHS by delaying absolutely non-urgent operations and delaying urgent treatment? That actually, the, the non-COVID deaths, we are going to see more non-COVID deaths uh, in the next six months. Well, certainly in the first wave, um, we didn't get as many patients through hospital with other conditions apart from COVID as we expected. And one of the things that we are very determined to do for as long as we possibly can over the winter is to continue to make sure that patients come to intensive care who who have a need for intensive care, whether that's COVID related or not COVID related. Now, obviously the most important factor in that is the amount of COVID that, that, that is in the community and therefore the people coming into hospital. If we can keep COVID down, we can keep all the other activity going, which is what we would like, want to do. Thank you all very much for joining me.